Hi everyone, and welcome to a very special live stream today. Um, please let us know if any of the audio is going wrong, if any of the video is going wrong. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment for us to see if we can actually go live from our tech centre here in Birmingham. So we've got Dylan on the machine. Give us a wave, Dylan. Yes. How's it going, everyone? How are things? Brilliant. We can everyone please let us know? Can you hear us? Can you see us? We've actually already got a lot of stuff going on around us and we've just started, which is brilliant. We've got forklifts going about. We've got people asking which way do they walk around. It is a live workshop. Um, it's, not a, it's not a controlled environment, unfortunately. So you get in the authentic Birmingham Tech Centre. Okay. Turn Turn it up. Up. I've, I've just turned us up a bit, uh, everyone. We've had forest. a few things saying we're a little bit quiet. I hope we're not shouting out. How's that sound? So right, we've got we've got uh, Josh over there yeah, in the tech, tech centre watching now. us and giving us some instant feedback. So cheers, Josh. Right, everyone. So what we've got here is we've got the the DMU 60 Evo. This is a five-axis machine. It's fitted out with everything you can think of: probes, tall-length probes. But we're going back to basics today. So I've given Dylan the challenge, he's got to try and set up these tools without using probes and set up his datums without using probes. So we're going to show you the best of both both worlds. Right, let's get into it. Go on Dylan, yeah, all yours absolutely. mate. So I guess I'll give a quick introduction into myself first. So my name's Dylan Smith, I've worked at Autodesk now for around about eight years. Um, I'm a manufacturing specialist, so that means I grew up doing an apprenticeship within this impressive facility. So my whole life's been pretty much, well, my whole working career has been spent around um, CNC machines, manufacturing, etc. So I might as well get straight into it. So welcome firstly to how to set up a milling machine. And what we're firstly going to do is show you a couple of the different tool types we've got. Um, so starting off, this is this is a collet chuck. And can you see that okay, Rich? So is that all right? Yeah, we can see you, mate. No problem. So this is something called a HSK63 collet chuck. And this back end is what fits into the machine. Um, so yes, me... that's really important there. Yeah. Different machines have what we call different spindle noses. So the machine bit that grabs the tool, we can have different ones. And that was yeah. a H... Is this a HSK... 63, there you 63. Are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Rich will be butting in every now and again because there's quite a lot to remember. And I've never run a machine live on YouTube, so here we go. Um... So as I just said, it's a collet chuck. So this is a spring-loaded collet here, which fits right into the end. And then how this works, it screws on. And the different collets have different sizes in. So this is a metric one. So it will be a, uh, like a 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16 maybe. Um, so yeah, you get all different types of collets. You get different types of back ends for different, different kinds of machines and different size machines. So in this case, as I said, it's a HSK 63. Cool. A couple of shout outs to some of our regulars. Yep. We've got we've got ice cream on here, we've got Akash. Um, we've got I am gonna make a horrible pronunciation of this, but Go on, Rich, have a go. Deniani seventy nine, I'm really sorry for murdering your name. Um, I do apologize. Go on, Dylan, sorry mate, I should yeah, stop no, interrupting no, you and let you worry, crack on. Sorry, please carry on. Um, so this is another back end, so this is a BT forty, so a tapered back end opposed to the HSK sixty three one. And the top of this is a shrink fit opposed to a collet chuck. So what that means is this isn't like a collet chuck in the sense where we put the tool in and we screw it on and tighten it up to a specified torque. What happens here is we heat the end up so it expands and then we put our carboy tool in and then it shrinks and then it's set the same way a collet chuck would be. Um, but something to remember, which is really important, as Rich said, we spoke about it before, it's really easy to do is put a, a high-speed steel tool inside of a shrink fit. Um, you'll never get it out again. It, you know, you, you, you've yeah. ruined Every, the tool. Everyone knows ruined, someone ruined that's put a HSS completely. tool in a shrink fit tool holder. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's, it's dead then. You'll never yeah. get that thing back out again. Think about that because the carbide does not expand when you heat the tool up. So the whole point here is you're heating the tool up and expanding that tool so you can put that tool in. If you put a HSS tool in there, the tool expands at the same rate as the holder and the thing will never come out. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. So Dave, one, one tip, always make sure that it's, um, make sure that it's a carbide tool. So what we're going to move on to next is how to 
manually measure it all within the machine. We'll look at some other alternatives such as third party equipment um, and we'll look at lasers and touch probes on machines. But we'll firstly look at the manual measurement machine. Yeah, so some really important stuff that's already been raised in the chat so far. What are the advantages and disadvantages to both of those? So the shrink fit is very accurate. It's what we call very concentric. It holds that tool very much in the line of the spindle. So imagine you've got your motor spinning and the tool will be very, very concentric to that. It also has very little deflection. When you look at the collet chuck types, effectively what you've got is just a massive spring in the mix. So yeah, it's going to deflect as it works because you've just got a giant spring that's holding your tool concentric as well. But it yep. is a lot cheaper. I'd also say an additional point to that is I've had issues in the past where I've made parts and the, the, the shank slightly caught on something which I thought was um, flush with the, with, with the shank of the tool. But these tools can still run out. So what I'd always advise is to put a DTI clock on the shank of the tool, turn it around a few times to see how concentric the tool actually is. Because just because it's a string fit doesn't mean that it's always going to be bang on. Um, so anyway, continuing on, please keep, keep, the, uh, keep the questions coming. We'd rather it be a two-way conversation. So what we've got here is a known length tool. So a gauge, uh, what, what would you call it, Rich? Uh, it, it's a tool where we know the length effectively. Um, and the length of this is exactly 100.043, and that's been measured, and we know that is facts. So this is our gospel tool for measuring all the other tools, and we'll go through the process now. So put this back So while Dylan's just walking around the corner there, he's basically, let me just turn that camera. What you see there is his tool carousel at the side. So that's where he has to put the tools in and out of the machine in that tool carousel. So there we go. We don't get much more live than this. We're... We're yeah. live, live from the tech centre, if that makes any sense. So again, we've never done this before. There may be slight delays in some of the processes because, as we said, it's not pre-rehearsed, it's live. It is a functional workshop. There's people all about walking around having a chat. So Again, all, a couple of reports on the audio. I'm trying to balance it out. We are literally in the middle of the workshop here. There are machines going, there are people moving around, there are forklifts. I'm trying to balance the audio so... Bear with me. Um, it helps if you let me know if it's me, Richard, or if it's Dylan that's too loud, and I'll try and do it there. Akash has got a, a good solution. He's just changed the volume on your headsets. Cheers, everyone, for bearing yeah. with us. We're, we're giving this a go for the first time. Back over to you, Dylan. Okay, so what we've got here is a setting gauge for tools. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this on the machine bed, but what I'm going to ensure is that it's on a flat piece of the machine bed. Um, and if, well, what I mean by that is, of course, all the machine beds flat, but I don't want it sitting on a little piece of swarf. Yeah, so what Dylan's putting in there now is a setting block that he can use to reference tool after tool after tool. Yep, yep. So what we've got here, a stone, you may be familiar with it. All this does, I simply rub this on the machine bed, and what that does, it gets the swarf up, which may be stuck in the little, the little crevices on the machine, um, on the machine bed, sorry. So we're just ensuring that that bed is perfectly flat and there's no small discrepancies yeah. there. How often do you do this on your machine? Um, for, uh, as, as a personal habit, I almost got taught by the older guys in here, the more experienced machinists, that every time something goes on the bed, do this just to ensure that it's completely flat. So we, yeah. uh, I've, you might not know, but in the Birmingham Tech Centre, I think there's over 120 years of uh, CNC yeah. manufacturing experience here. So... I must admit, um, we're like every machine shop in the world. We've got some new blood yeah. and some old blood. Yeah, yeah, some people that should probably retire but are hanging on for dear life, Carl. <laughs> I'm going to get that in the neck later for saying that one. So Dylan's just going to wind that tool over, wind it over onto that, that setting block and bring it down to that DTI says zero. So again, it is live. I forgot how slow that the tools move when the door was open. <laughs> So, as I said before, we'll slowly bring this down because it doesn't go very fast when the doors are open. We'll slowly it, bring Dil, it mate, over your, to the If you gauge. can move slightly to the left for me, Dill. That's it. Yeah. That that's way. it. You're covering up the tool. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. That's perfect, mate. Brilliant. So, what I'm doing here is I'm bringing this onto the setting gauge. Um, and the setting gauge has a clock on the other side, which I don't think you can quite see. But it's essentially the same, same face as a DTI clock. What I'm doing, I'm winding the tool down on the setting gauge. 
and I'm going down until that clock reads zero. What we'll do after this, everyone, we'll just bring that up a little bit close to the camera. So Dylan's behind the screens to make sure we're uh, COVID safe today. So just another thing as well, me and Richard can't hear each other very well because we've got a big barrier in front of this due to um, COVID-19. So we, we may talk over each other every now and again as well. Yeah. But So what I'm doing, I'm bringing it down onto the setting gauge. And initially, I'm using the 0.1 increments. But as we get closer to zero on the finer details of the clock, I'm going to then bring the increments down to 0 0.01 and then eventually one micron increment. So that gets us to zero in the most accurate manner. OK, so I'm there now. So I'm on zero. So if I come over to the controller now, Rich, can you see that very well? That's it. There we go, mate. You're all good. So just, just as a side note, I'm on preset number three here. Yeah. And the work that I'll be doing will be on preset number two. So this is a separate preset for setting my tools opposed to what I'm doing for my actual work. Uh, and that'll become more apparent in just a minute. That's fine. One thing we haven't mentioned so far is this is a Heidenhein controller. Yes, yes, so yes. So this is, is, this, is this a TNC 640? Yes, it is. Yeah, so this is a Heidenhein controller and we're using offsets numbered like one, yeah. two, three, four, five. Yeah. If you're used to like a FANUC maybe, you'll know it as G54, G55, G56. They are in essence exactly the same things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, compl I completely forgot about that, the one, two, three, four. It is, it is, it is very different to others for some reason. Um, anyway, so if you can see here that I'm at Z plus 10.4, blah, blah, blah. What I want to do here, because I'm at the perfect Z height for this tool, I've set it to zero on my setting gauge. I now want to go into my preset table, come over to number three, look at the Z, and then I want to zero that. So can you see that very well, well Richard, that zero now? Let's give this a go. Let's see if we can get there. Let me have a look at that. How's Hopefully that looking? Can you see that Z zero? Z zero? Yeah. So we're at Z zero. So what this does, this sets the gospel Z height for all of our other tools. And by gospel, I'm not sure if that's a phrase which I've picked up or it's an industry phrase, but um, that means the setting that we're going to use for every other tool and we follow that no matter what. Does that make sense, Rich? Yeah? Cool. Brilliant. Rich can't hear me through there. No worries. So cool. If you could just show us that right close to the camera, mate, so we could see what that actually looks like, what that setting block looks like. Yeah. You could just show it to us. Absolutely. A couple of people have said they want to just have a quick close-up look at that setting block and what it actually looks like. So what that does, we press that in. Can you see that, yeah? Yeah. We press that in, and the more you press it, the more the clock turns around. Yeah, Brilliant. that good? Cool, so okay. that's what that setting block looks like. You can use this. This is probably what I would say was the next level down from a probe. Um, we are going to be showing you later some ways of doing it just with a piece of paper or even without the paper and just going for it. But yeah. this is the next best thing if you haven't got a probe. Yeah, so that's the setting gauge. And I then use that height to set all the other tools in my carousel. Um, we'll quickly talk about other options which we've got. So the first option, we could have a third party piece of tool measuring equipment, such as a hammer, which we've got here in the Birmingham Tech Centre. So the Hamer takes different back ends from HSK 100s, HSK 63s, BT 40s, etc. And what that does, we take our tool, let's say our HSK 63, we put it on our Hamer. We then can either measure the diameter, we can measure the height, we can measure the radius on the tool. Um, and this is an extremely calibrated piece of equipment, so we trust this. Um, and as I said, it's a third piece, a third party piece of measuring equipment. Alternatively, what we can use is the laser or the touch probe on our machine. Yeah. What this will do, this will, be, this will be much more autonomous than doing the setting gauge, which I've just showed you here. Um, but this is a very universally accepted way of measuring tools. The only, the only kind of caveat to that is you have to ensure that your equipment's always calibrated. Um, so I guess that's it, Rich, unless you've got anything else to add yeah, on what, tool what measurements. What I want to say is... I have been to a company, you know, where money was tight. And what they did, they made their own presetting gauge. They milled out, like, the back end of a BT40 tool, so that cone. They then had just a height gauge next to it on a block. And they used their height gauge as a presetter. I mean, I don't know the price of our Hamer, but I bet it costs more than a height gauge. I'd say so. So, so you know, 
if you haven't got the money, it doesn't mean you can't be doing this. That's what we're trying to show you today. It would be really easy for us to have just got the lasers out, got the probes out, and done it all automatic in, in a couple of minutes. We're trying to show how we can still make parts without those uh, lovely probes and lasers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we're going to show you now, we're going to walk through setting the part up. So in the part, setting the G54, setting the work plane, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we're also going to look at orientating the part or the work holding in which you're holding the part in. So we'll start off with orientating the part or the work holding. So I've got a vice here. And there's a couple of ways that I could do this. The first way I'll talk about is a probing cycle. So fortunately, I've got the luxury of having a nice expensive machine with a top of the range controller, um, a nice probe. And I fortunately have a probing cycle in which I can take two points and that will set my... It will set that face of probe to be parallel with the X or the Y axis. So if I give a quick demonstration of that, which will only take me two seconds. This is a really important thing now. So it doesn't matter if you've got a three axis machine or a five axis machine. You need to make sure that your vice or your component is level along that orthogonal axis of your machine. So Dylan's going to quickly show with the probe and then we're going to show it without the probe and how we would do it with what we call a DTI or a clock. Um, or I'm not sure what else anyone else calls them, but a manual device that's going to give us a readout. So Dylan just positioning his probe there. Um, we'll just quickly open the door and show you what that actually looks like. Yeah, inside. No, of course. Um, so again, something which you want to remember is when you're probing something that's or it. even clocking it with a DTI, you want to make sure that what you're probing or clocking is known to be parallel. Um, you don't want to be using a face which it may be a little bit skew so what i'd say is if you've got a vice which has a fixed jaw and a, a fixed jaw and a mobile jaw always go off the fixed jaw that's some good advice actually that is some really good advice so what, what we've got here we've got a lang vice and this has two moving jaws so rich made a good point earlier we have a very long straight fixed face on the side there which we know is ground and which we know is square so we could come off this face, but for argument's sake, we'll come off the jaws because I know for a fact that it's just as good coming off these jaws. So let's close the doors and let's run the quick cycle just to show you what we mean. And again, this doesn't matter if you've got Lang voices like what we've got here, if you've got Rome voices, if you've got an eBay special voice that you got for a couple of pounds or dollars, setting up this voice is really important. So what I'll do, I'll take the first probing point on the left side of the jaw. Hopefully you can see that a little bit, Rich. Rich, can you see that? On yes, there? Yeah. we can just about. Let me move the camera a smidge just around there because your visi port's in the way. There we yeah. go. So I've took yeah. the first point on the left-hand side of the vice. If we move over to as far as we can go and then take the second point, the controller will then work out how out of how out of rotation it is, so how far is it off being parallel with the x-axis. Um, it's only 0 0.08, so what I can do, I can insert this into my preset table for anyone who has hide nine, and then we can move it. So if I go number three, enter in preset table, okay. And then what we do, we 0 0.081 out, so we just square that table back up. Okay, so the second way, which I believe will be much more accessible to, so everybody is using the DTI clock. So if I bring in my chuck, so again, Dylan's got the lovely thing here of having a tool carousel where he's got a DTI that's going to be inside the tool. Those of you that know me in the live streams, I talk about my little hobby machine I've got at home, a Denford Nova Mill. What I actually do for my little Denford Nova Mill is I've just got a mag block that I put on the side of the, the, the spindle or the head of, of the machine and I move it left or right from there to get it square. Dylan's got the luxury of having a three-jaw chuck that he's going to grab hold of his DTI with. Let's have a close-up of that DTI, yep, Dylan. Yep, yep, So what we've got here, we have a DTI clock, which is detachable from the clocking arm it's on. So we've got the DTI clock there. 
And then we have the clocking arm. So the clocking arm is made so it can fit in a chuck inside of a milling machine or a lathe. Um, so the DTI clock fits straight on there, he says, screw straight on, and then that goes inside of our chuck here. Brilliant all. Quick note on, on what we're doing today. So, um, you know, we're in the workshop. Um, we're trying to be as COVID safe as we can. We've got screens all up around Dylan, screens all up around me. I hope the video quality is good enough. Um, I'll be watching this again afterwards and we'll see what we can do again. If you want more live streams live from the tech center, let us know in the comments and we'll hopefully try and make this a more regular thing. So Dylan's now just going to be moving that over um, and he's going to run that up and down the side of his part. So what he's got to think of here now is you know, he needs to set that right, he needs to move it up and down the side of his part. Dylan's got the lovely luxury here of a five axis machine. So he can just rotate that vice to get it square. If he didn't have that, what he would have to do is get a, a hammer out, slacken the bolts off a little bit, and just tap that vice and move it so it became square. Those of you that have done this before will know um, sometimes you get frustrated, hit it a bit too hard, and end up messing up all the work you've already done. Um, but it's a really important step. This is something if your vice will, will stay on the machine, you only really do once um, and then maybe check it every now and then. Yeah, okay, so I think something worth mentioning about DTI clocks is that they come in um, kind of different increments in which they're measured in. So what we've got here, we've got a DTI clock which has increments of 0 0.01 millimeters. So this gives us a decent degree of accuracy, but what you can get is DTI clocks which have a finer degree of accuracy, so maybe two microns, so 0 0.002. But for what we're doing here, squaring up a vice, this is more than good enough. So what I'm doing is I've wound onto the parallel, the parallel face of the vice. Um, I've got it close with the 0.1 increment, and then we've got it, I've got it perfect with the micron increments. What I'm going to do now is run that DTI clock across the face and see the discrepancy from side to side. So because I've just done it with the probing cycle, I expect it to be pretty much perfect. Can you see that, Rich, the, uh, the change? Yeah, we can yeah? see that that is looking good. So we can't see the needle, of course, but we can see the whole point of it. So okay. Dylan's now is going to look at the needle and go, right, I started at zero. I have now moved across, and let's say it's reading 10. He's now going to adjust that rotationally using his extra axis or knock it with a hammer. So when he goes from left to right, that needle does not move or move so little it's acceptable for the amount. But yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's kind of subjective as well in how much you think good, uh, how good you think good is, if you know what I mean. So what do you find acceptable? But I'd say, you know, if, you, if you're in 0 0.02, that should be good enough for most applications. Um, but obviously, I can't speak for everyone, so. Perfect, brilliant. Cheers for that, Bill. So, right, now we need to look at how we would set up a block of material. We're going to show you three ways. We're going to show you using the probe. We're going to show you using a tool with a slip block or a piece of paper. I'm not quite sure what Dylan wants to do. And then we're going to show you the third and, if I'm honest, the way I do it, which is just turn the spindle on and go until you see a bit of swarf and then you know you've hit the part. But we'll show you those three methods uh, and talk about their advantages and disadvantages as we go as well. Again, cheers everyone for joining in on the chat. This is quite difficult if it's a bit stale. Um, so we really appreciate the interaction on both ways on there as well. I even recognize some, uh, some internal Autodeskers tuning in and, and giving us some support. So appreciate everyone tuning in. This was a bit of a risk, but by the looks of the chat and the watchers, this is paying off. So thanks, and we'll do our best to make this a bit more regular. So again, as Rich mentioned, the numerous ways to do this. Um, it all depends on the circumstance you're in and what you prefer, really. So me personally, as again, because I have the luxury of a machine like this, I just use the probe because it's quicker, and I trust it because I know how accurate it is, because we carry out routine calibration checks on all of our, uh, all of our equipment. Um, but we'll be showing you more of the kind of democratized ways, the ways which everyone has access to. And as Rich said, same with a piece of paper, same with the tool spindle until you see swarf, and then same with a slip gauge. So I guess we'll do the slip gauge first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get 
my calibration tool, the one that you the one that you seen earlier. Did I put that back in? You must have done, mate. Have you, have you lost your calibration I must tool? Have, I must have done. Oh must no, have done. he's lost the calibration <laughs> tool. I must have done. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> um, one thing I just want to quickly say: someone's pointing out this five-axis machine. Little fun fact for you: my wife would kill me for saying this is fun facts, but this is what we call a nutated head. The is this a A and C or B and C deal? Uh, B C. This, this is. is a B and C. But the B axis is not actually in line with the Y. It's at 45 degrees. So it's quite complex inside the machine. When it has to move the B, it has to also rotate the C to keep it level. So uh, it's quite an interesting machine because the, the B axis is not actually completely in line with the Y axis on this machine. OK, so what I'm doing here is getting my tool there or thereabouts, close to the surface. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to... So Dylan's got this setting tool in here now. Um, I haven't got a setting tool at home. So what I do is I get a, a, an end mill, put it backwards in that collet chuck, and you then get a very accurate setting bar. Um, you know, it's going to be very flat. It's going to be very round. Um, cost saving tip, if you can't buy a, a calibrated tool or don't have one, Put an end mill backwards in a collet chuck, and you have a really nice defined tool then. So what I've got here is a slip gauge. And if you don't know what a slip gauge is, it's essentially a gauge in which we know the exact dimension of the one side. So this is a 30 mil slip gauge. And Rich made a good point off camera before saying, sometimes you can get slip gauges which look the same in both ways. And I think this is one of them. <laughs> so it's a 30 mil. It doesn't look too different in each, in each yeah. axis, but... Um, I know that that's the 30 mil size. I've so definitely been victim to holding a slip. I see what yeah, a 10 yeah. mil slip block. I think <laughs> it's like nine point something on the one side and 10 on the other. Yeah. It's it's the it's the faces that look like they're mirror finished to the faces you want to have. So I'm so just going to set up from this now. What I'm doing is I'm bringing this tool just in line with the slip gauge there, and what I'm doing I'm feeling the gap in between the slip gauge and the bottom of the tool, because I know the exact length of my tool and I know the exact height of the slip gauge, I'm going to know the exact um, coordinate of that face in the Z. So if we can get our slip under there, move down a touch, and an important point to remember is if the slip gauge is underneath the tool, don't bring it down because that's not good for anybody. So. We check again, it's still not touching. I say it's a bit difficult for us to capture this, but what Dylan is doing now is moving his slip block underneath the head of the machine and then moving the machine down. And when he gets to the point where he's moved the machine down and he can't get that slip block underneath, it'll go back up a tiny bit until he can, and then he knows that's the actual length. This does require a little bit of feel, and you get used to doing this. Yeah. So what I've got now, I, I know that it's slightly too low, so I'm going to change the increments in which I'm moving in the Z. So instead of moving in 0.1 increments, I'm now going to move in 0 0.01 increments upwards. So if I move five upwards, so one, two, three, four, five. That's it. And a really key thing here, a top tip, is never wind the machine down with your block underneath. I would bet a lot of people on this call have been victim of that, and they've damaged either the tool or the block by actually winding it down onto it and damaging it. Always have the block to the side, move the tool down, and then move it underneath. Never have it underneath and wind down. Yeah, so it's, it's you, you almost just know when you've got it, don't you? It's just a feeling. There's a little bit of resistance there, but not enough that you can't get the slip gauge underneath it. Um, so what I do from there is I know where my tool is. I know where my tool is in relation to that face because I know the size of the slip gauge. So if I wanted to set my Z0 on the top of that face now, I'd simply set where I am now to 30. And then when I go down 30, I'm exactly in line with that face. So that would be perfect. Um, so that would be my Z set. So if I wanted to set my Z0 on top of that face, that would be done now. So uh, should we do the, the, the X with the uh, spindle on now?
Yeah, let's do the X with the um, with the tool. Let's use a slip block at the side. So a couple of people are saying that we can use a, a dow. So yeah, again, what we can do, we could put a tool in backwards um, and use that as a dowel, and then use a slip or even a piece of paper against the side. Um, Dylan's going to show us just with a normal tool on the X. Uh, we're going to show you the way you should do it um, with a slip, and then we're going to show you my favourite way that I do at home. I turn the spindle on. I slowly jog the spindle against the machine. As soon as I see Swarf, I know I've touched. Hang on. That's what I'm reading the chat. We've got Alan Z coming. He's new to CAM and got a quick question on here. Um, so his question is, when you load a program done in Fusion, does the program use the tool offsets in the machine? So, Alan, it uses the tool offsets in the machine. The, the tool lengths you've got in the, the Fusion tool library are then mainly for simulation purposes. We will always get the tool length offset from the machine itself. That's why it's so important that you get the two married up correctly. So Dylan, what's that, a 12 mil mm? That 12 mil mm in there? 16, that is. 16 mil mm. You can see how far away from the machine I am. Um, so 16 mil mm is going to wind that near the block, is then going to rotate it backwards with his hand and use a slip gauge or a piece of paper. I think he's got an old setup sheet he's going to we'll use. Paper. And he's going to feel when it grips that bit of paper. So again, we showed you using a probe, which was our best case scenario. Then using a calibrated tool, and we're going to keep working our way down in different levels. So he's, Dylan's just ripped a, a slip of paper off yep, his setup sheet. Bit. And he's now, most importantly, going to rotate that tool backwards and feel with that that effectively a slip gauge, but just a piece of paper, um, yeah, and yeah. see when it grips. So go on, Dill, you can do that. Step to the side, and we can yeah. hopefully see what's going on. So it, again, it's very much like the slip gauge process. It's incremental. You've got to move it, tiny little increments, keep turning it, keep feeling it, until you find that biting point. So you want to be super careful because you don't want to jam the tool into the job. Yeah. Um, Still, it might be worth you going the other side, actually. Other so side, yeah. Yeah, it might be worth. That's it. That's got it. Well done. Yeah, that's, that's quite that difficult is. to see where the tool is in relation to the face. Oh, then. Yeah, that's the issue. That's, that's going to be no good. Good point. Again, everyone, we are trying our best on here. I hope this is working out for you. Um, so I think an important point which Rich mentioned is do make sure that you're running the tool backwards and not forwards because if you do run it forwards, you, if you go too far into the pipe, you could chip your tool, you could, uh, yeah, it just won't go right really. Make sure you yeah. turn your tool backwards is the moral of the story. Again, so he's going to turn that tool backwards. Backwards is the important thing here, unless you've got a left-handed tool, in which case you want to be turning it clockwise. But I can't remember the last time I actually had to use a left-handed tool. So Dylan's going to now get, get that piece of paper in there. He's getting really close, and he's going to feel for, for when it's touched. Now, again, we're setting up a raw block here. I bet we could be 100 microns out, and it wouldn't make a difference. You've got to choose, effectively, um, what uh, is the method you're going to use. Again, in my case, at my hobbyist machine at home, I haven't got anything like probes or calibrated setting tools. I have to just make do with what I've got. And I normally haven't got the time. I'm trying to run it between making the tea and doing other jobs in the garage. So I just try and do this as quick as I can. Normally just spinning that tool up, winding it till it touches the block. When I see Swarf, I know I'm there. Yeah, so that's just nipping the paper now. And you'd probably argue it's not as um, accurate as maybe a touch yeah. probe. Maybe not as accurate as using a slip gauge, but... It gets the job. It, it gets the job done, especially when you've got stock. I mean, I'm not that bothered about point one there, really. Um, if it's if it's a side two setup and you're referencing off machine faces, maybe that's a little bit different. But for this particular purpose, that's more than good that's enough. That's it, definitely. If this was the second side of a block, there is no way we'd be doing this. We'd spend the time. We'd take a tool out, put it in backwards as a really accurate dowel. If you haven't got a dowel. And then use a slip block to date them off the edge there. So, got to think, what Dylan's now got to do, he's put that tool against the side of that block. He's got to set it at zero, 
but subtract half of that tool. So it's a 16 mil tool. He's got to set that to yeah. eight millimeters off what he read on that machine. Yeah, if it's a good point. If you've got a slip block in there as well, let's say you've got a 10 mil slip block, you'd have to subtract 18 mil off. So you have to do the slip block and the radius of the tool because you got to think the machine thinks in spindle center line. It doesn't think about tool edge. That's the whole reason why we have cutter compensation. So, right, everyone, we are 36 minutes in. Um, we're not doing bad for time. Let us know how you think we've done today. Let us know any topics you want to hear later. We've heard someone say they want to look at an OP20 setup. We can definitely think about planning one of those. So Dylan's now just getting his, uh, his, his, his controller ready. We're just going to hand jog that over, turn his spindle on, and we're going we're to go for that then in there. So we've got, yeah, a, give we've me got just Alan a who's second. joined us again, and he's getting a lot of help from a couple of different people. Um, this is nice, nice seeing uh, everyone helping each other out. Dylan's machine has got a very safe I wondered why the, I wondered why the spindle won't turn down because the doors are open I still. Say, he's got a very safe interlock on this machine, so... Uh, you probably can't see, but that tool now is spinning quite yep. nice and happily. Let me see if I put the camera yeah, of course. about there. Hopefully people can see it. Go on, Dylan. That's it. You can move that around now. Yeah. So, as Richard said earlier, the point of this is, and again, this definitely isn't a, a side two setup thing. If you're going to do this off a machine face, you might ruin your part. Um, but if, if we're setting off stock and we've got, you know, you're going to have two, three mil aside, minimum you'd hope, setting off stock. So you can afford to go in 0.1 gouge into the stock just to find your reference point. So, so what I'm going to do I'll is... stress again, if you don't have to do this, please don't do it. But we just want to show you in stages going down how to set up machine yeah. tools. You know, I bet you there's some people out there that won't admit to doing this that do it. Um, but again, this is like a last resort of how to set up a raw block of material. Yeah, I, I, I think I've done this maybe twice in my life, and it, this will probably be the last time. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to lie. Nick, the workshop manager, is probably shrieking watching yeah, us yeah. do this now. But again, we're just going to... The spindle's on. We're going to wind really slowly into that block, and then as soon as Dylan sees a bit of dust coming off, a bit of swarf, he knows that he's touched on. Again, right, come on in the chat. Is anyone going to admit to actually doing this? There we go. Just we a go. little touch. Just, just little a little touch. touch on there. Perfect. And again, the same principle applies as Rich said last time. We then take the radius of the tool over. So the center line of the tool is in line with that edge that we've just touched on. And that then finds us that edge perfectly. Well, not perfectly, but good enough. Um, we might as well show the last one, Rich, if we've got time. Just the, 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 the touch probe. Yeah, yeah, let's do the touch probe. Yeah, we'll finish off with that. So what I'm doing now is I'm calling my tool up. Apologies if you can hear a machine, aggressively machining something. Um, so I'm going to call my probe up. We're then going to touch on each side to find where they are. Exactly the same theory as the last three, but just a different way of doing it. So people have uh, in the chat asking for like a series on parts, and I'm just trying to think of it now in my head. The problem we've got, of course, is we don't want these videos to be like four hours long. So what we might do is, if we show you the principles of it, we let's say we set up and run the first toolpath. Hopefully then I might have like, here's one I made earlier, and we won't put that in for OP20. So let me have a think about this, and I'll see what we can come up with, see if we can show you a series of, uh, of how to really set and date of a part. But we probably can't show every toolpath run, because we want to try and keep these things nice and short and to the point. So Dylan's just going to wind that, that touch probe in now and get that set up. If you could let us know, um, has the background noise been acceptable? Again, this was a bit of a, a risk for us, let's say, um, to say the least. Has it been acceptable? Do you want to sort of see these things again? Yep, sure. So exactly the same as the, the last three um, methods really, a different method, but we're gonna get to the same point. So I'm gonna touch on the top face, I'm gonna touch on the front face in the Y, and I'm gonna touch on the side face in the X. 
So I'm going to I'm going to reference all three of them to zero. Then our diet will be on the top left hand corner. So that's if really we go... important here. In fusion, Dylan has got this set up to that top left hand corner. So let me just show you what this looks a bit like inside of fusion. So what we've got is we've got our, our datum set up here, top left hand corner of our stock, and we're just going to probe that then. And then we've just got two really simple toolpaths to run. So Dylan knows that's his datum, and he's got to match that up in his machine. Also notice which way around it is. The block is longer than it is deeper. The block is matched that in the way there as well. So you've got to make sure the block is in the same orientation, and you set the same points up there. Yep, so I've set them three um, positions now. So I've touched the front face, X positive, the left face, X po Y positive, sorry, on the front face, X positive on the left side, then Z minus on the top. So as Rich said, the datum's on the top left corner. So if you run that, Rich. Rich, do you want to run that toolpath then now? Yeah, let's run that toolpath. Sorry, I was reading the comments. Basically, there has to be like a cooking show where we go, we've got to put one in the machine and go, and here's one we made earlier. And Unfortunately one not. <laughs> I do like that. that that's going to be quite yeah. good. Unfortunately, um, I would like to say I'm probably a better machinist than I am cook. And that's probably saying something bad of how, how bad my cooking actually is. Because I'm not that good a machinist when it comes to people like Dylan, who does it every day, day in, day out. So, uh, Pavan, um, as well as about anywhere the tool doesn't want to go. So, what you can do here is a couple of different ways. You can use stock contours to limit where the tool cuts. You could use boundaries to stop where the tool goes. And also, um, there is an extension functionality which you have to pay for, which is called toolpath trimming. And that allows literally me to select a tiny bit of a tool and get rid of it. So you've got two options in base level fusion, which would be boundaries or stock contours. If those aren't good enough and you need real infinite control, then you can get toolpath trimming. So that's three options for you. If you Google any three of those, you should hopefully see some good videos on them as well. So I did set the date, but I set it in the wrong preset, so we'll have to do it again. Oh, you put the wrong preset in? Oh, no. Come on, Dill. That's not good enough. Classic. So again, that's a really important thing I want to stress here is I am, um, you know, I don't run machines every day. I probably do them once a week. I'm a very nervous runner when I when I run the machines. In my opinion, things will go wrong in that first cut because your datum could be wrong, your tool length could be wrong. So I always make sure I'm really slow and just gently bring my tool in for that first cut. From then, I'm confident that what I saw in the cam simulation is going to represent on my machine. So that just needs to be bear in mind here, is that you want to, when you run, bring that first cut in really gently and then be able to, you know, make sure that you're happy with everything. I bet 99% of crashes happen when they first um, come into contact with the part, or in some cases, the bed if it's gone horribly wrong. <coughs> Oh, I definitely need a drink at the end of this. Bear with me. Dylan's having some fun here setting his part up. Yeah. He's got a, again, he's got a very safe interlock on this machine, and sometimes it drives him crazy because he tries to pull the door open with it shut, and then it goes, you can't do that, the door's shut. Okay, the probe system doesn't want to turn on, so I have to bring it in and out. Right, there we go. Well, this was always going to happen, so it's fine. Don't worry it's about it. It's worth just changing the preset in the NC code. <laughs> what do you say, sorry? Just change the preset in the NC code. I don't know what it does. Sometimes it just doesn't turn itself on because when you call the probe, it's supposed to just turn itself on straight away, and it usually does. Yeah, it, it is meant to turn itself straight on straight away, but oh well, we can call that probe out again and put it in there. Yep. Yeah. Stuart's there saying he's not lucky enough to have a Heimer. Um, neither am I at home, but again, I've seen some really nice ideas with people with like a a cone to hold the back end of a BT-40, and then just a height gauge to measure the top of the tool. You could just make up what, whatever will work for you, really. It hasn't got to be anything special. Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit difficult with these windows because we've actually got, we've got a screen in between me and Dylan, and then we've got the screen of the machine itself. So they are clean, 
Um, if I just pan back and show you what sort of setup we've actually got here, we've got, this is where I'm standing, um, here. We've then got this big screen between me and Dylan, and then we've got the machine itself. So we do appreciate that it's probably not the best video footage. We are doing what we can in these uh, testing times. Is there a DMU60 EVO post-processor post infusion? Yes, there is. We use the um, the Hyde 9 TNC640 post-processor for this machine, and we've make a, made a very few minor tweaks in the post options to get it to work for this. But again, we will try. We might even look at maybe having two cameras set up next time, one right inside the machine and, and, and one out so you can see us. But again, I, I think this hasn't gone bad for our first attempt at a... Uh, a live stream live from the machines but from what you guys are saying hopefully there'll be more of this to come are we all set up dill we are right we're reset this everyone. time we go. right reset it. this time right yeah. let's bring that camera a little bit closer and we'll actually see this toolpath run what you've all been waiting for there tell you what i do so need to do one sec sorry sorry i've got oh, one more no, thing what's going on now sorry i forgot to put a little minus offset on the um uh, bear with, why. bear with, guys. This stuff happens. Come on. Everything we've been saying, we forgot to do. It would be nice if we. Yeah. No, we will. We'll definitely. I think what I've learnt from this one today is I need two cameras. We need one right in the machine and then one outside, and we can hopefully flip between the two. But we really appreciate you all staying with us today for this, uh, let's say, experiment. Um, I think it's gone all right. There we go. Tools coming across now and milling across. Absolutely lovely. There we go. We almost know Easy what we're doing. Easy as that. Easy as that. Brilliant, it everyone. That is pretty much concluding what we've done. We really appreciate everyone staying with us for this today. Um, I'm glad we've done it. You're hopefully going to see a lot more of these. Um, we've got some brilliant ideas. Thanks very much, Dylan. You know, this was a, an interesting one to, to give it the yeah, first definitely. go with. Um, brilliant everyone have a good day all catch you again next time and don't forget to subscribe like and hit that bell icon so you see me and Dylan next time trying to faff around on the machine brilliant everyone speak to you all soon bye bye, bye. sorted